Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture five. So this lecture we are looking at the idea of equality and inequity and then particularly through the lens of the inequalities that exist because of poverty, family separation and then of course our implications for us as educators. So let's start off by looking at some definitions. So the equality of opportunity is the way that we have access to social institutions and that means things like education. So we're seeing at the moment in Iran for example that we are seeing women basically excluded from education in all forms. It was started with the universities and now it's happening to our secondaries as well over there. So they are being excluded purely because of their gender. So we've got equality of condition and this is where you will see quite often the disadvantages because of what you were born into. So they are often to do with poverty that we're talking about now. And then we've got equality of the outcome. Through, so if people all have equal opportunities, they should end up equal regardless of their circumstance. However, what we know is that is not accurate or true. So this particular cartoon is one that I see being used a lot for different circumstances. It's often seen, but I don't know if people truly understand, because when we talk about fair, sometimes we apply fair to the example that is on the left. So everybody gets the same thing that gives them access. So they all get the same size box. But equity means that we're providing the right thing for each individual, which might appear to not be equal, but it is providing equity. So everyone will be able to achieve. However, in distribution, it may not be equal. And that's a really hard thing for parents, schools, educators, politicians, and so on to understand. And even the general public often sees that as we're giving so much to these particular organisations or this particular minority group and so on. So we need to be really aware of how we present information and how we explain things. So using diagrams and cartoons like this is great, but we have to give the context to it. So we have to make sure that we understand what it means by equality, distributing everything the same way and equity, equity, making sure that it's distributed according to need. So for example, standardized tests, they don't allow that. They apply an equal standard to all students, regardless of their abilities, issues or talents. If we can use technology, we can provide more equity because then the technology allows us to do it in a way that best suits the individual needs. Or you may have assistive devices that will make things for them or you may have particular resources and so on. So we need to make sure that we're providing not just equality but equity. So equity means that we are doing things for those who are most in need. So for example if we look at education, countries with greater inequity in education that usually means that the governments have distributed the resources according to potentially political pressure that they're experiencing. So they're not distributing the resources according to the true needs. If we have a look in Australia, we actually have a disproportionate amount of resources that are allocated to our Kimberleys in our rural and remote areas. That looks like it on paper. However, what we know is that that if you just look at it on paper and we look at it through a lens of equality, it's not being distributed equally. It's being distributed according to equity. So the people who are working in those remote areas, they need more resources because they can't just whip it down to Kmart and buy something. They need to have everything available at the school. The children in those schools have a greater need. So they need to make sure that they have access to the best resources. 
we don't have access in those areas to the same degree of specialists that you have down here in Perth. So you have to make sure that you are providing equity of resources, which might look like unequal distribution of money. So we have to make sure that we are really clear about it. Yes, it's a very interesting political hot potato that happens. So we have to make sure that we are making clear what is the difference between equality and equity. So what causes it? Inequity generally happens because there is not justice and fairness being put in. And so people look at it from the point of view of they say, oh, but if this was fair, everyone would get all of that money or everyone would have all of those resources or everyone could access that. Yes, but does everyone need it? It goes to the people who need it the most. So that's where we need to make sure that we do sometimes have inequality that creates equity. So rural areas often don't have the best educational opportunities for children. So that poor quality is due to factors like budget cuts sometimes. There's fewer teachers that want to go and teach in those areas. We don't have enough programs that allow potentially teachers to go and explore it and so on. So therefore we don't get teachers who choose to go and work in those areas. That's why I love at Notre Dame we do have this um, promotion for prac students to be able to go into our rural and remote areas. People who would never get those opportunities are given funding to be able to go and teach in those areas to explore to see if that's what they would like to do. And they're interviewed, they're given the opportunities. And from the outside, it would look like that's not equal because essentially they're being given money to be able to go on prac. And I know that other people have said, oh, why aren't we given money? But what we need is to make sure that we have good teachers who go and work in our rural and remote areas. So therefore, it appears to be un inequitable, however, inequal. However, it makes it more equitable in the longer run. So we have to make sure that we are really clear to anyone why things happen in education in the way that they do. And also that we, if we ever get into positions of power, we advocate to make sure that we are creating equity, equity not just equality. And that often comes down to money. So when we look at the impact of things that create inequities within our world and within our education offerings and within the way that children are able to achieve, one of the greatest issues that we have is poverty. So if we have a look, poverty in Australia there are 3.3 million people, which is about 13% of our population, living below the poverty line, which is about 50% of median income. So that includes 761,000 children, so 16% of our children. Now, the poverty line works out to be around just $489 a week for a single adult and $1,000 a week for a couple with two children. Could you imagine trying to live every week, not just for some weeks, for a couple with two children on that amount? It would be very tricky, particularly at the moment with our current rents. So the average weekly earnings in Australia, our seasonally adjusted average weekly earnings are over double that. So uh, generally around the $1,800 a week uh, that was at November 2022. So absolute poverty means that you are on the poverty line or below. So generally, if you are on benefits of any sort, so single mother benefits, um, you are on a disability allowance, you have a Centrelink and so on, generally you are sitting at or below that poverty line. And so you are not potentially in absolute poverty, but you're jolly well close to it. So absolute poverty means that you lack the income to purchase the basic necessities. It's our homeless people. They are in absolute poverty. Now, we don't have accurate statistics. I went searching. We just, there, there's so many different amounts that we have for our homeless. So absolute poverty generally is our homeless people or people with severe issues. Our relative poverty is those people who are 
living with our benefit systems that we have. So the income is far below. And as I said, it's about half of low incomes. Um, so it, it's not great. So they will have a low standard of living compared with other people. And what that means is that last statement there, families in poverty, they cannot provide all the opportunities for their children to develop talents or acquire new skills. So for example, if they want to get their children into sport, you will rarely find somebody who has come from poverty who is a top golf person, let alone in the equestrian field or even in one of our games like soccer and so on. Because for a child to continue to play in a team sport, so my son, it was getting up to be about $500 per season, not including clothing or shoes. Now, if you are in relative poverty, that's inconceivable. You, you can't afford $500. Some sports teams do offer kind of like a scholarship, but that means your kid already has to be pretty good at it. And that's why programs like the ones that Clontaff offer for the AFL stream and so on, that means that children who are from our rural and remote areas, they are given the opportunity opportunity to develop their talents and to acquire new skills. So relative poverty is where a lot of our people in Australia sit. Now we know as well that what happens is that they are often clumped together in certain areas. So when you find out your prac schools, have a look on the My Schools website and you'll be able to see the ICSIA level and you'll be able to see the income levels and so on of most of the parent community in your area for your school. And that will give you a really good idea of what's going on in the school because what we have is a clear correlation between poverty and academic success. There's many reasons for it, but it is a clear correlation. So if you come from poverty, academic success is harder. And there's many reasons for it. And we will start to unpack a few of them shortly, but also looking at some rather larger societal issues as to why that will happen. So a couple of infographics about different things. One in four Australian kids is threatened by poverty. So that means that we have children under 15, 17% of them are functioning and living at 50% poverty line and the red ones, we've got another whole lot of them at 25% of our children under 15 are operating at 60%. Now, this was 2017-2018. The data that's coming out from the last two years as a follow-on of the pandemic is anticipating that there may even be another 10% added to that because combining the job losses and the job uncertainty post pandemic together with rising rent and general cost of living means that people who are generally considered at the lower middle class are now falling down to be sitting just above poverty line and are just able to make ends meet, particularly if they are renting. Now what's starting to happen with our interest rates is that our mortgage belt all of the edges of Perth where they are heavily mortgaged and they don't have a lot of equity in their homes with the interest rates that are starting to be consistent and rising every single time the Reserve Bank meets, that will then start to have a massive impact on people's ability to pay their mortgages back. And then we will have people flooding into our rental market again because they're unable to keep up their mortgage payments. And then we know that we're already in rental strife over here in WA, as is most of Australia. So we're going to continue to have over the next five years or so this impact on where the poverty line will be and the amount of income that a family needs to have to be successful and to be at a comfort point where they're not feeling threatened by poverty. So let's have a look at five fundamental concepts that contribute to a cycle of poverty. So what we have is that individuals who live in poverty, 
they're going to lack educational opportunities and success. It comes down to some really basic things that happen as well. So certain schools, if they have families who are better educated, who have higher educational success levels, so most of the levels of uh, academic success are at university level for the parents in the area, you will generally find that they push for academic success in their uh, children. So it means that the school has children whose parents want them to be there and so on, and they see academic success as a really positive thing. And so they push for different opportunities and so on. Whereas in other individuals, they have difficulties learning. They potentially have undiagnosed, unmedicated issues because financially they can't go and get the screening or the support or the psychological support and so on. So that they end up with much poorer prospects. And then we often find lots of dysfunctional relationships. We know that money and money stress can cause stress in a relationship, which can lead to a dysfunctional relationship. So the people have the issues and then it manifests in all of these different areas. So when we look at our society, we have our low paid casuals or our very part timers it leads to potentially family breakdowns. Again, lots of fights about money. Poverty creates stress in the family. When people are needing to rely on the government for handouts, it means that they do not feel the same sense of success and value in their community. So we end up with people who are not feeling part of the world that they live in. We have our charitable organisations that need support from everyone and we need to have a balance of people who are able to give and volunteer to our charitable organisations so that they can actually give to the people who need it. And things like COVID dramatically impacted on that and places like St Vincent de Paul, the Good Samaritans, various other food bank organisations and so on, they were unable and are still a lot of them unable to meet the demands of people who are requiring their help. So we have this idea that society needs to balance out a little bit more. We can't have a massive underclass in Australia. We want to have a balance of different sorts. We also don't want to have a clear set of classes within our world to start off with. So within our culture, what we have is families and whole peer groups falling into this sense of failure where they have frustration at the world, they have anger and that will manifest as antisocial behaviour and we can often hear words like they fall into the welfare trap because as much as you might hear those ads, $2,000 and you can put a deposit down on a house, if you are earning at the poverty line, you cannot even save $5 a week. And if you can save $5 a week, why would you save $5 a week when you know you have to save up however many years to be able to earn that $1,000 to put down as a deposit? And by then, you're fairly sure that that won't be available. So they fall into that welfare trap and they're unable to get out of the welfare trap. So they're living from paycheck to paycheck or from support check to support check and they're not able to see a way out of it. Some families do get very trapped in that and then what happens is they'll self-medicate and they use alcohol. They might turn to crime to supplement their income in some way and often results in very low self-esteem, which again, they'll turn to alcohol and so on. So we have to be really aware of how that impacts on our culture. And again, certain areas will have greater degrees of that. So you will see when you go to certain schools, there's a different feel. There's a different way that the children, the parents and the community all interact with one another. So understanding where they're coming from and making sure that you are relating to it and, and really authentically trying to understand. Because I know for me, 
it's a difficult thing to understand. So I have to spend a lot of time talking with different families and so on. So looking at the settings where people live and work and how they interact with their environment. So what we know is that as we drive through different areas, Perth has some suburbs which we term our leafy greens. Now, I know I live in a leafy green. So I live in a suburb where I can walk a few hundred metres and there's a park. I can drive 20 minutes out from where I am, 20 or 30 minutes, and I will get to other suburbs where you struggle to find a park anywhere. There's not a lot of open space for the children. There's uh, lots of graffiti. There's generally some high crime rates where you wouldn't walk around after dark and so on. Because again, if you go back to the one above, you've got people who are engaging in antisocial behaviour. They don't feel connected to their community. They don't feel part of it. So they are acting out in other ways. So we have our environment that contributes to that poverty cycle. And what we know is that we talk about it as a cycle. Poverty is cyclical. So your past and your poverty experiences and your expectations of the future are different depending on where you have grown up. You are potentially going to expect that you will never get out of it. And generations go through this. So that's why we want to see people who are in that poverty cycle, we want to support some people to work out potentially with education, how they can move out of it. So that's why we spend a lot of time in secondary schools counselling and helping children to see all the support mechanisms so that they can move on to higher education in some way. However, as early years educators, we need to help children see that education is important, how we can be helpful for that and that's part of developing those authentic relationships with the families making sure that we are not seen as the people who are making them feel worse about their situations so by organizing excursions and sending a note home saying we're off to see aqua can you just provide fifteen dollars for the bus and the entrance fee some parents would look at that and that is prohibitive it's just not going to happen for some parents and they will be too proud to tell you that they can't afford it and they will just keep their child home and then their child will be resentful and then you'll do the next two weeks of activities related to that excursion so the child will act out. Can you see how it's cyclical? It will continue on. So you need to think how are you going to make sure you are not actively contributing to creating that cycle but we are working with the families to work out how to get around it. So what we know is that when we look at a family, most families, they're quite resource poor. Schools make a big difference. Now, oops, I've put a couple of things in there. 60% of Australian children are raised in families with incomes below $50,000. Massive. Half of all children in one parent families live on less than $20,000 per annum. That is horrendous. And one in five, they're raised in a jobless household. That means that somebody who is the traditionally would be the main income earner, they are unable to earn an income for whichever reason. It might be that they don't have the necessary skills. They may be unable to because of a disability or a workplace injury or something like that. So they are jobless in some form. That where you have poverty, you will often have lots of job mobility because the jobs that people get are not long term jobs. So that means that they're chopping and changing quite often, which can disrupt children's lives because that could mean moving in some way. And that about 600,000 families in Australia have one biological or natural parent that doesn't live in the household. So they're single parents or they are not, not living in the same household. So adding in these other details, what we've got is lots of people work 49 hours more per week. This bit really scares me. So 6% of children with a low birth weight, what we know is that that is a predictor for educational difficulties 
46% of them who are living in poverty will have long-term medical difficulties and 7% will have a disability. And unfortunately, we have over 90,000 cases of child abuse or neglect reported each year. Now, even in affluent societies, which is Australia, poverty is the greatest child killer. So more children die from poverty related conditions, which could be anything, than from any other affliction. This part is weird. So poverty is as prevalent today as it was decades ago. It hasn't changed. The proportions haven't changed. We know that it means that people who live in poverty, they're going to feel depressed, powerless, and they're unable to control their destiny. If you're unable to control your destiny, you don't really care about it. So that means that it manifests as isolation, chosen isolation, depression, and often parents will pass those feelings onto their children. So what we know is that if our educational levels increase, poverty decreases. One quarter of people who don't finish secondary schooling are in poverty. So it means if you don't finish school, you're pretty much one in four of you are going to be down below the poverty line or sitting on the poverty line. So our role as educators is to make sure we prepare children to be successful at education. So what we know is that if we can invest in good quality, accessible and affordable children's services, it helps lift the families out of poverty. And what we know is that that has the optimal outcomes for children during the first six years of their life. So the National Association for Community-Based Children's Services, they are doing research and they're very committed to ensuring that the chances of Australian children are improved by access to high quality, affordable children's services. So it's making sure that our childcare services are appropriate. It's making sure that every child has access to an educational place as well. So if we have a look at this from a couple of years ago, We've got this idea that half of us are feeling like they're doing okay. Only 4% acknowledge they are sitting on easy street. We have 28% of people who are sitting on struggle street and 14% who are barely coping. Now those proportions, I think if we did one of those now, that proportion of doing okay would be dramatically reduced and the barely coping would be dramatically increased as well. I don't think Easy Street will change. It may even be a little bit more because we've had some people emerge out of the pandemic sitting fine, but we've got a whole lot that are not doing okay. Now, what happens with poverty as well is that we actually can lead to social exclusion. So it means that they can't participate in certain activities because they can't afford to. So it means that the activities that they can do are free or they're things that they do which are not appropriate in some way. So it affects their now and their future. So what we need to think about as educators is how do we provide the best opportunities for everyone in our community? So we need to think what are things that we want to avoid and what are we going to help with? So this is where you will find in a lot of our rural communities, they will have homework club. They will have sports clubs that school teachers run. They will have community centres that you will see the schools heavily involved in. Because what we want to do is create that good blend of creating community and education. So what we want to try and do is build the right relationships with our community and then also make sure that we're having really, really positive impacts on everything about the children. The more that parents and community members understand that the school is there to support them, not to exclude them, not to suspend them, all those sorts of things, it makes such a difference. So we want to be supportive but we also want to be preventative. So running things like a breakfast club, like a homework club, like after school activities, like, you know, simple things like a coding club, all the different ones that you can run, they are preventative because what we're doing is give the children 
lots of different activities that they can do so they're not doing anything inappropriate and they're being occupied and they're increasing their educational opportunities. So poverty on our intellectual development of children. Again, scary. Incidence of mental illness or delay, six times higher among children who are raised in chronic poverty. Now that could be because of a lack of prenatal care, a lack of uh, pediatrician, pediatric care when they are newborns and so on, a lack of good nutrition. There are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, a lack of knowledge from parents because they just don't know what to do for their children and so on. So six times higher amongst children who are raised in chronic poverty. So children who are raised in poverty are more likely to be undernourished and we know how important vitamins and minerals and good food is. They're more likely to have substandard housing as a consequence to be ill more often because they're not nourished and they might be cold or too hot. They're less likely to receive health care, particularly at the moment with our benefits and our Medicare not covering most doctor visits anymore. So oftentimes what they're doing is they're finding more and more families are disorganized. So children are missing appointments, not attending school as regularly, all those sorts of things. And that is in comparison to children from wealthier suburbs. And what we know with poverty as well, it's intergenerational because they get stuck in the cycle. It's very complex and it's very hard to break. So we know that poverty has a potential to really impact on intellectual development and performance. And that's why we need to always keep in mind, how do we keep families out of the poverty cycle? How do we help the children rise above where they are unfortunately just aiming for. We want them to think what, how do they get out of it in different ways. So in terms of what we have as some core beliefs, children, they're the same. They always need love, protection, health, nutrition, and they need to feel they belong. This was heartbreaking, this photo that I found. There are entire communities that live on the rubbish tips in different countries around the world and they make their living out of selling items that have been dumped and so these children spend their lives living literally in a tip so that's in our developing nations however in Australia fastest growing poverty group is children one in five in our developed world live below subsistence level that's well below the poverty line. So families with children, they make up a significant percentage of the homeless population that lives in shelters. And quite often shelters will give preference to mothers or fathers with children over single people. So at least they get to live in the shelters rather than literally on the streets. But you will still see families living in cars at different locations around Perth. And I'm finding today that a lot of families, they're unable to meet their basic needs for care and emotional support because they're having to work a lot or they're just not able to meet their own. Therefore, they can't meet their children's and the children will come to school with those needs not yet met. So then they will need those needs met at school and therefore it will often come out in different styles of behavior. And we need to think how do we handle and cope with those different types of behavior? So what we need to be able to do is provide hope to our children and families. So children who are at risk of school failure, as in they stop attending or they're not achieving and often the two go together. But if they can participate in good early childhood programs, they're going to be able to succeed. Now, for every dollar that goes into early childhood, there is a return of equal amounts because it saves in the long run. So it makes sense for us to be the best educators that we can because then it returns its investment to the government and to our society, not just to the government, but to our society. Now, moving on to our next predictor of issues that we will have. So divorce. Divorce in Australia. So what we know, 47% of divorces involve children. 
So we know that we have over half of our uh, relationships that will end in divorce or uh, separation. And so we define children as being children under 18 years. And there are almost two children per divorce. So the median age of females granted divorces was 42, which means that children are going to be in the equation and that the median length was about eight years and 41% of applicants were made jointly. So it's scary. There's about 132 divorces in Australia every single day. Now, this means that we are going to have a massive impact on our world. So the reasons why people get divorced, finance is the top reason. So that's why people in poverty have a greater incidence of divorce. Now, if you are a product of divorce, you're probably going to get more, you're more likely to be divorced. And this was interesting, more likely to get divorced if you met in a bar, you've got money problems, you're a smoker, you're in touch with other divorced people and you have a daughter instead of a son. I didn't get that one. <laughs> so less likely if you have a greater education and you're over the age of 25 and you're an atheist. I was like, interesting. I found those stats very interesting. So let's have a look at what happens with family separation. We always ask the question, do young children really understand divorce? So divorce and separation, they have difficulty with it. It depends on their stage of thinking. So if we break it into this idea of what preschoolers understand and what school children understand. So young children, their family is mum, dad, or mum, mum, dad, dad, whichever is their family and the people who all live together. And if you get them to draw a family, they'll often include the dog, the fish, everyone, because it's all the people who are very important to them. So it's not the idea of blood relations. It's the idea of who they consider to be their family. So older children, on the other hand, they look at it through psychological rather than just the physical. So they won't talk about the people they live with and so on. So younger children will be more upset due to abandonment. And they often, because they equate everything to themselves, they might see themselves as partly to blame. They might think, if I wasn't so naughty, mummy and daddy would still be happy and so on. So they will put some blame onto themselves. Older children might be able to conceptualise that different, but younger children will often see it as their fault. And that if they were quieter or if they clean their rooms, it's so heartbreaking that the things that they say. So children aged three to five, these are the things that you will start to see that will manifest. So they will be very angry or they might be very sad. They really don't have a good understanding of what's happening but it will manifest in the behaviours that could be irritable or clingy to their parents or to you, or it could go down the aggression and the temper tantrums because they are feeling out of control. So they're going to feel a bit insecure. They might revert back to some things like thumb sucking. They might start wetting the bed. They might have trouble with their toileting if they've been dry and so on. They might blame themselves and they will often manifest as having trouble sleeping. In our younger first few years of primary school, where you will see them quite often in the year ones and twos, the boys will be openly grief stricken. Boys really suffer because I'm not wanting to be too general, but you will often find it's the dad that leaves in a standard male female relationship. So therefore the boys are losing their beloved father. They will then have Boys and girls have lots of trouble concentrating. They'll feel abandoned and rejected, of course. And they worry that that lost parent's going to be replaced. And especially when parents start to move on with other partners and so on. And sometimes the anger is expressed towards their parents or indirectly. And it might be expressed towards you as well. So things that we can do as an educator. We have to know what's going on. So if you're at all concerned... Make sure you talk to the parents about it. Apologies for the dog barking in the background. Don't know what he's doing. Be very aware of custody issues because they can flick really quickly into violence 
very negative things. Police may need to be involved and so on. So make sure that if you know children are going through separation or divorce, be very conscious around Father's Day, Mother's Day, Grandparents' Day, um, any of the things that you have. Give them privacy and you need to be the stable environment so that they know what's going on at every point during the day. Work out how you're going to keep the parents informed. Some great, really, really simple tips are if you have two parents, add them both to the seesaw, the email list and so on. What some parent groups suggest is that the parents, because sometimes you can only send an email to one email address, there's always a primary and a secondary. So what some parent groups suggest is that the parents create a shared email that is the one email and both parents access that email. So then there is not information shared uh, and accidentally sent to one and not the other. So for example, reports generally only go to one email address and then it relies on that parent sending it on to the other parent and of course they use it as a power play. So help them to work out how they're going to share information. Plan generic parent events rather than just focusing on the mother or the father and provide them with lots of stories. There are some fabulous picture books all around divorce, separation, so on. And there are different school initiatives such as the Rainbows Program, Seasons for Growth and so on that talk about grief because children do go through a sense of grief as their time is changing with their families. Now think how do you create authentic connections? So can that idea of social connectedness be achieved through the internet and give you lots of benefits that families can have that would be potentially the same as face-to-face -face social connections. All right, let's do a quick review. So inequity and inequality, they're different but connected. Our job as educators is to balance it out the best we can. Poverty is our greatest predictors of issues with equity and inequality. And divorce and separation will always affect the children even if it has a positive impact of removing violence, anger, uncertainty, or anything like that, it's still going to negatively impact on the children. So next week, we talk about continuing barriers to partnership. And in our tutorial, we will unpack lots of the impacts and our possible suggestions of how to cope and help with lots of the issues that we might see.